Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Ash. I am the engagement manager here at the Center for Biolog Biological Diversity. I'm based in Oakland, California, um, and I'm going to hand it off to my co-facilitator and moderator, Diane. Hello and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm Diane. I'm one of the organizers here at the Center. I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. And again, we're so glad to have all of you on the call tonight. I see so many familiar names and many, many new ones. Uh, so it's great to have some connection and community right now with all of you. Speaking of that, we had, I think, 3,500 people sign up for tonight's call. So I'm going to give folks a few minutes to hop on. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to go over just three quick notes about using Zoom for tonight for those of you who are new to the program. So first, many of you have already been using the chat box, but that is at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to use that space to say hi, to comment and connect with each other. Um, just keep in mind that the chat box may be distracting for others, so try to keep it to the content of the call. Second, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen as well. It's really important that you direct your questions here because as I'm sure you've already seen, they may get lost in the chat box and we wanna make sure to get to those. And third, if you called in on your phone and you're not using the Zoom app, you unfortunately won't see these features, but you can always reach out to us after the call with any questions. And finally, before we jump in, I just wanna share our community guidelines. So please remember on the call tonight to follow these principles on your screen so that we can ensure a respectful and inclusive space for everybody on the call. To summarize these for our friends on the phone, we ask that you be respectful in interactions with others, be inclusive and follow the Hermes principles and agree to nonviolence. All right, now I would love to introduce several of our experts, my esteemed colleagues here at the center who are on the call tonight. And first, I will pass it over to Tierra. Hey, everybody. I'm Tierra Curry. I'm a senior scientist based in Portland, Oregon, and I run our Saving Life on Earth campaign. Over to Tanya. Hey everyone, my name is Tanya. I'm uh, our international legal director. Um, I'm based out of Seattle, Washington, and I work globally for wildlife. And I'm going to pass it over to Sarah. Hi, everybody. Uh, Sarah Yolman, I'm our international program director here at the center, hunkered down uh, in my basement actually right now, working from home in Seattle. I'm going to pass it to Brett. Hey everybody, um, I'm Brett Hartle. I'm the Government Affairs Director at the Center. Um, I live in Arizona, split my time in DC, but I'm also staying at home like at most everybody else. And it's good to see you all. Uh, I guess I pass it to Kiran. Yeah, Hi, I'm Kiran Suckling, the Executive Director and one of the founders of the Center. And I'm in Tucson half the year in Portland and uh, right now lucky enough to be on the Tucson side during the uh, shelter in place moments in time. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for being on. And I will actually pass it back over to you, Kiran. Great. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming on. Just a really a tremendous, uh, tremendous response. And I think this is a good time while we're all grappling with this global pandemic. And, uh, being stuck at home, being isolated from others, uh, for many of us seeing people that we know become very sick, worrying about our children, um, for us to realize that this global pandemic is part of a global wildlife problem. And that is the exploitation, exploitation and global wildlife trade that allows diseases to not just pass from animals to humans, but to do so in a way that can get out of control on a global level. Uh, this has happened before, many times before, and it's going to happen again uh, after this crisis is over. 
And so it's a really good time for us to think about that and figure out how we can actually prevent it from happening again. Just today, a reporter asked Trump about this and said, are you considering shutting down uh, international wildlife trade, at least temporarily, uh, to address this since that's the cause of this? Um, and his first response was, well, this came from China. I heard it came from China. Um, and so you see there this uh, odd uh, but predictable pivot to a sort of blame, uh, a kind of racist approach rather than thinking, well, actually, you know, people didn't forcibly send uh, this disease to America. We're part of an international wildlife trade system. Um, and the answer to this is an international action. It's not blaming the source country. It could be any source country. Uh, it's the trade that's the problem, not the source country. Um, and also predictably, of course, he said, well, no, it's not at the top of my list. So hopefully we can make it become at least near to the top of his list. And so with that, I want to thank you again. And uh, I'm also looking forward to hearing from the amazing experts that we have lined up here today to talk about this. So we launched the Saving Life on Earth campaign this January to build a movement to end extinction and to raise awareness of the urgent need to create a more equitable world where diversity of plants and animals and diversity of voices are valued and protected. And now we're all working from home in our awesome pajamas and finding new ways to stay connected with even more awareness that it is a small world after all. And we need to take care of each other and the millions of plants and animals that we share the planet with. One thing that this challenging moment shows is that everything can be different, can be more sustainable, can be more just. But even in the midst of this crisis, bad policies are moving forward that exacerbate the extinction crisis and the climate emergency. So we're fighting all the fights we have been fighting and we're fighting for 1% of the stimulus funds to go to protect wildlife habitat, end exploitation and protect biodiversity for the sake of all of us and all of our health. So we're working harder than ever and we're thrilled that you're joining us in Saving Life on Earth. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Tiara, really appreciate that. I'm gonna take over here and actually hold a conversation with a couple of our experts. And uh, tonight um, we have Tanya and Sarah here. Uh, Tanya, I'll start with you. Um, we're here tonight because of, the, of a global pandemic, but before we talk about COVID-19, I'm wondering if you can specifically tell us what you know about infectious diseases and what roles animals play in them. Yeah, thanks, Ash. Um, so you guys, infectious diseases as a whole cause about a quarter of human deaths. Of these diseases, almost 60% are zoonotic. So what's zoonotic, you might ask? Well, my favorite definition, I think the best way really to think about zoonoses is they're diseases that normally exist in animals that can sometimes affect people. To put it in context, in the past 40 years, the worst pandemics were all zoonotic or vector in origin. So think about HIV, SARS, avian flu, swine flu, Ebola, Zika. They all were zoonoses or vector-borne diseases. Of the known zoonotic diseases, over 70 to 75% of them are from wildlife. So for example, the last coronavirus outbreak, and yes, this is not the first coronavirus pandemic, SARS was another coronavirus, and it was a spillover, or it's a jump of a virus from, in that situation, from a bat to a civet. If you don't know what a civet is, it's a really cool cat species. You should definitely Google it. But anyways, it jumped from the bat to the civet to a human. Wow, it's easy to see how humans could get diseases like the bird flu from an animal like a chicken. Uh, that was raised for food. But I'm wondering how we are getting diseases from wildlife specifically. Yeah, so wildlife trade is the primary culprit, but human consumption of wildlife and our entrance into and destruction of pristine wildlife habitat are all to blame. So in terms of wildlife trade, 
I want to be really clear, the U.S. is definitely a part of the problem. We usually don't think that's true, but it is. So we're estimated to consume around 20% of the global wildlife market. The U.S. annually imports on the order of 225 million live animals and 800 million specimens of wildlife. And yeah, we're to blame for some of the pandemics too, just as much as other countries. The monkeypox outbreak of 2003, that was US demand for wildlife, including for pets. The H1N1 or swine flu outbreak of 2009, the first reported cases there were in the US and the disease was pinpointed here and in Mexico to our domestic pigs. We even named the pandemic of 1918 the Spanish flu, even though it was first reported in the US, but of unknown origins. All of this is important to remember as we see politicians and others voicing blame on other cultures and countries. It's sadly not the first time that this has happened, but creating divides isn't helpful, especially now when we all need to be working together. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Um, actually, sp speaking of working together, can you explain uh, to folks on the call tonight what the center does in the international program to curtail the harmful effects of wildlife trade or excuse me of the wildlife trade um, like infectious diseases yeah in a nutshell in our international program we use u.s laws and we use international agreements to protect wildlife globally um, so you've probably heard that we've taken action for species like elephants and giraffes and lions and leopards but we also fight for lesser known species like the vaquita and sea cucumbers and some of the most beautiful blue tarantulas you've ever seen and so many more. We use laws like our Endangered Species Act to protect wildlife being affected by trade. The Pelley Amendment to leverage trade sanctions against countries who fail to live up to their international commitments. On the international level, we also fight for wildlife. Um, and we do that by an international agreement called CITES, or the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. This is the agreement that brought us the global ivory ban. We also fight for species habitat. So we work under agreements like the World Heritage Convention to ensure that biologically diverse and important sites are protected, like where Trump's foul southern border wall is being built. Um, thanks so much, Tanya. Um, several activists on the call have been working to draw attention to the extinction crisis. So how does our work tie into this pandemic? Well, thanks, first of all, to all of you guys who are writing, who are working on the extinction crisis. And, you know, this work is really crucial, as we all learned last May, from over 150 experts convened by the UN and the IPBS assessments. You know, they made it clear that overexploitation is the primary driver of extinction of marine mammals and the secondary driver of extinction of terrestrial species. Now, of course, habitat loss is a close second or first, respectively, and that's why we work to also protect habitat internationally. And I think it's important to recognize that in our Saving Life on Earth report, we joined with others around the globe in calling for protection of 30% of terrestrial freshwater and marine ecosystems by 2030, and 50% conserved by 2050. Thanks so much. Um, I actually included a link to our Saving Life on Earth uh, report in the chat box. Um, so now to focus on COVID-19. Specifically, um, folks on the call have probably heard several different theories about how we got here. Where do we stand today on the science of how this pandemic got started? Yeah, it's a good question. And what we know so far from the genetics of the virus is that probably like SARS, it might be linked to bats. But there's also a possibility it's linked to a species called the pangolin, scaly anteaters, and actually the most highly trafficked mammal in the world. So there's a few different theories that scientists have on the origins of, of COVID-19. So it's possible the virus leapt from a bat to a pangolin, critically endangered Sudan pangolin to be exact. But it's also possible that the virus leapt from a bat to another species or from a pangolin to another species. The market where the disease is thought to have spilled over to humans had numerous species of live wildlife on any given day. So the disease could have evolved in the market 
in the close and cramped cages and conditions that are typical of these so-called wet markets. And then it made the jump to people, either by shedding, that's when someone comes into contact with a sneeze or a cough from an animal. It's also possible that it reached humans from the direct slaughter of an animal, so contact with bodily fluids. There's another possibility though that the virus could have developed somewhere on route to the market and it was brought there by a wild animal. Yeah, thank you so much, Tanya. Um, super appreciate that. We may never know exactly how COVID-19 started since, since the market was cleaned up by the time it was ID'd as the likely source of the virus. Um, but the message, the bottom line is clear coming out of this public health and wildlife crisis. We are literally making ourselves sick by our endless need for wildlife and wildlife products and habitat, and it's essential that we change our practices before we spring another pandemic on the world. So tonight we want to highlight one species that is tragically high in demand, already been mentioned, pangolins. Um, they've been in the news recently due to their potential link to COVID-19, and as the most traffic mammal in the world, their story provides a clear view into the link between wildlife trade global public health and the extinction crisis. Um, so I'm now gonna ask um, our other panel, Sarah, can you tell us more about penguins? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, Ash, and thank you, Tanya, for your presentation. Um, you know, many people are just hearing about penguins for the first time because of course, they've been in the news a lot lately, but the center have been, has been working on this species for quite some time. So let me introduce you. Um, so as you can tell from the slide, uh, pangolins are, I'd say, one of the more distinctive animals on Earth. They are the world's only mammals with scales, literally covered from tip to tail with hard scales that are made of keratin, essentially what your fingernails are made out of. And it gives them this sort of armored appearance. Um, they have these long tongues that they use to lap up their only food source, which is termites and ants. Um, they're about three or four feet long. And in my opinion, they are completely adorable. Um, our uh, communications guy, Patrick, is fond of saying that they look like pine cones with legs. Um, I've heard other people call them walking artichokes. Um, and if it's possible for them to get any cuter, they do, because the pangolin moms carry their babies, carry their, their young on their backs. It's pretty adorable. Um, and then when they get frightened, they curl up into a tight little ball. Um, you know, because they are covered with those hard scales that are, are pretty sharp on the edge, this is actually a really effective protection from predators, say a, a lion. But unfortunately, just lying there in a ball makes them really easy pickings for poachers who just pluck them up by their tails and put them in a bag. Yikes, that's awful. Um, can you share a little bit more about the trafficking of, uh, trafficking of pangolins, Sarah? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, scientists estimate that over a million pangolins were captured and traded between 2004 and 2014 alone. That's around 300 individual animals a day. This severe level of trafficking is obviously causing severe population declines. So at this phase, at this, at this point, all of the pangolin species are facing extinction. So why are these critters so in demand? And there are two reasons. First, their scales, and second, their meat. Now, some people believe that pangolin scales have medicinal properties, helping everything from dispersing blood to promoting lactation. I wanna emphasize that there is no published science to support that belief, but it nonetheless persists. Um, second, second, pangolin meat is considered a delicacy in some places, and due to pangolin's rarity, the price for pangolin meat is really high, so the animal's consumption is considered a status symbol. Um, you know, unfortunately, even as pangolins and their threats are becoming more well known to the public in general. I, I understand there's the pangolin in the remake of the Jungle Book movie from a few years ago. Um, pangolin trafficking really just remains rampant. Um, for example, just last year, authorities in Singapore seized 25 tons of pangolin scales in a single week. It's sort of hard to estimate how many scales equals how many pangolins, but scientists say this could be 35,000 dead pangolin, pangolins in essentially a single haul. Oh my gosh, Sarah, the thought of so many pangolins being poached feels absolutely like horrible um, and completely daunting. 
what is the center doing to stop this? A lot. Um, we're working at both the international level and the U.S. domestic level to make sure that our laws shut down the pangolin trade. At the international level, this means working under the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, or CITES. That's one of the treaties that Tanya mentioned earlier. And this is a treaty that, as its name suggests, regulates trade in imperiled species. Um, in 2016, with our partners, we pushed the party societies, so the, the nation societies, to uh, vote to end all commercial international trade in pangolins, and we were successful. It means that in the, at the international level right now, it is illegal to import or export pangolins or their scales for, for sale. But we also work here at home. Now, the primary demand for pangolins is in Asia. There's no doubt about that. But the reality is that there's still demand here in the United States for pangolins too. I think people would be surprised to hear that. Um, pangolin skin boots are still available for sale online and pangolin scales continue to be sold as medicinal products here. There was a 2000 report, excuse me, 2015 report that um, documented a number of products advertised as, cont as containing pangolin scales uh, all over the internet and even in brick and mortar stores selling uh, supplements. Um, I actually did some research for a legal filing just last month and in one hour found two different online stores selling pills that they were advertising as containing pangolin scales here in the US. Oh. Man, so what can we do to make sure that the U.S. isn't part of this larger problem? That's a great question, and I'd say the answer is twofold. Um, first, to raise awareness about the extinction crisis, and we are doing that right here, right now, with all of you. Um, and second, to list pangolins under our U.S. Endangered Species Act. Um, now, I know you guys online probably read our our press releases and, and the messages that you get over emails. So you know this is something that the center does all the time, making sure that imperiled species are getting the protections that they deserve under our US law. So back in 2015, we propo proposed pangolins for listing under the US Endangered Species Act. And in the US Fish and Wildlife Service sat on the petition, we filed a lawsuit last month to force the agency into action. Um, can you just clarify, what would listing uh, under the Endangered Species Act do for a species that doesn't actually live in the U.S.? It's a great question. Uh, again, a few things. First, bring more attention to pangolins and their threat from trade. Uh, bring more money to their conservation. And most importantly, if a species is listed as endangered under our Endangered Species Act, there's a strict ban on any sale of pangolin products within the United States. Because right now, that's legal. Um, you know, ultimately, we really must do our part. I know it sounds a little hokey, but um, here in the United States, we absolutely have to start being a global legal observation. We must be part of the solution and not the problem by ending our own nation's demand for wildlife and shutting down the wildlife trade for good. I really can't agree any more with you, Sarah. Um, thank you uh, to both Tanya and Sarah. It's been really elucidating. Um, and it's really clear to me as an organizer that now is not the time to give up. Uh, clearly, there is still an assault on wildlife and with many workplaces and services shutting down, this is a time to organize more than ever in order to save life on Earth. We have to be courageous, creative, and bold in this time of uncertainty. Um, Honestly, like this is a defining point for our movement and how we collectively choose to act will define much of what happens over the next months and years for our planet. And so uncertainty can be scary and overwhelming and taking off my facilitator hat, like me, Ash, the human, like I'm scared and overwhelmed, but I know that each of one of us has a responsibility to stay calm but think deliberately and move uh, towards solution through this difficult time. We can still take action, that we still have that. Um, and that's how we win and we create the world that we want to see. Bottom line, wildlife and endangered species depend on this. And that's why we're inviting each one of you to our next Saving Life on Earth call in two weeks kicking off our brand new digital organizing plan. We're moving at breakneck speed. 
media is on an hour by hour basis right now. Um, and that's why we would love to have you on this next call to kick off our new plan to go digital. We have to still exert people power, even if it's digital. And that's why we'd love you to join the next webinar and our plan, get involved. So right now I'm gonna launch a poll that will pop up on your screen. And I'd love for you to click yes. And um, while you're thinking about that, while you're mulling about that, let me just tell you a little bit more about this and kind of the uniqueness of where we're at right now. This is not actually a time to pause our collective work, but a time to respond creatively and more collaboratively collaboratively and listen more effectively embracing and responding to the disruption. As we transition many, many facets of our organizing to digital platforms, we realize that the, the massive amount of people power required to keep our movement strong during these times, um, we have to be ready to bounce into action once this passes. And honestly, we can take action right now, especially with so many people stuck at home, wondering what's going on, if they can help. Now is the perfect time to get involved. Um, we know that for some of you, if you're looking at this poll right now, you're like, oh, digital call, I don't know. Some of you digital, the digital realm is foreign. Totally hear that. We're asking you to stretch and go outside your comfort zone right now. Sign up. If you're curious, if you're interested, or if you're willing to go out of your comfort zone because you know wildlife depends on it, sign up and be a part of a support network that will help you take this leap. Now is our chance again to create the world that we wanna see. So go ahead and click yes on the, uh, on the poll to join our call and find out how. So I'm gonna close the poll now. I'm gonna give maybe uh, three, two, one, great, we're gonna close out the poll here. Thank you so much to everyone who, who took action. Um, if you are calling in um, without a Zoom app, unfortunately, um, you, won't, you weren't able to see the poll. Don't worry about it. We're gonna send a recording of this webinar in an email tomorrow, and that's where you'll have a link to register for the next, uh, call where we'll go over our new digital plan for saving life on earth. Okay, so now we're going to get to some questions and answers. Um, please note that with um, so many hundreds of you on the call tonight, there are, oh gosh, why use the word hundreds when we can use the word thousands? There are nearly 1300 people on the call tonight. That is the most amount of people we've ever had on call. It's fantastic. We won't get to all of your questions. Um, and if that happens and you still, and your question wasn't answered, you can email us at mobilize at biologicaldiversity.org. Okay, so with that, um, uh, we have a lot of questions kind of on similar themes. Um, so there are just a couple folks um, that who are wondering um, just if maybe Kiran, you could just say, revisit again briefly um, what the center is doing, um, particularly on the campaign front in response to the coronavirus. Yeah, well, you know, we've got sort of two different things going on. Um, and one is this, despite the virtual shutdown of activity in the country right now, the Trump administration is pushing forward uh, a whole slew of anti-environmental policies. It's continuing its rollbacks. In fact, it's speeding them up because um, the administration wants to complete these environmental rollbacks before the next election uh, in case Trump is not elected and it won't happen. Or secondly, in order for him to brag about having done them. So we've got a, a tremendous need right now to hustle as they try to rush these through at a point in time where it's very, very difficult for the public to be engaged uh, with this. So on the one hand, uh, we're working with coalition of groups nationally uh, seeking uh, a shutdown 
of new anti-environmental policies by the government until the crisis has passed. Um, and then unless and until that happens, engaging with all the individual um, decisions going down. So it's, it's a tremendous uh, a lot of work, made all the more difficult by the fact that we've closed all our offices and we're almost all working from home. Uh, but luckily our staff is uh, externally motivated and, and capable of doing this. And then secondly, on uh, the COVID issue itself, we are pushing uh, the government to address international wildlife trade in uh, bills that will be passed to respond uh, to the crisis. And we're also pushing the federal agencies who already have authority um, to deal uh, more effectively with wildlife trade to do so. And we're reaching out to the media um, and folks like yourselves so people can understand what the issue is. And just today we had a reporter finally ask Trump point blank about this issue. So some progress is being made in getting the media to understand how, how central this is. And so that's the work we're doing now and, and we'll continue uh, throughout this crisis. Thanks, Kiran. Um, I'd also just like to add to that um, our new digital organizing efforts. Um, as you know, the world, many organizations are rapidly turning all of their organizing efforts um, into the digital realm. Center is no different. Um, there are plenty of actions that you can take right now, this evening, um, via our website at biologicaldiversity.org um, and start taking action right away on the numerous campaigns that Kiran just mentioned. That's a great way to get plugged in and involved. Um, and you can um, sign up for our call, which is uh, on Tuesday, April 7th. It'll be at same time as this, 4.30 p.m., 7.30 p.m. Um, and if you weren't able to answer the poll to sign up for that, don't worry. We're going to send that link out in an email tomorrow. Um, and we will be um, sending out more communications about what you can do um, between now and then um, so you can stay active. Um, okay. Next a uh, couple questions. Um, a few folks are wondering um, specifically about the US role in uh, wildlife trade and wondering um, what we can do to stop the, U the wildlife trade here in the US. Um, maybe Sarah, is this a good question for you? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one on. You know, I think Tony did a really good job of summarizing some of the stats in her talk. You know, I think people are really surprised to hear how much of a role the United States plays in the global wildlife trade. They think it's elsewhere. They think it's China, it's Asia. But no, it's right here in our very own backyards. You know, um, 225 million live animals uh, imported every year, um, 800 million specimens every year. It's, it's, really, it's, it's really scary. Um, so what can we do? The biggest tool that we have that the center is very fond of using is our Endangered Species Act, um, which again, if you get a species listed as endangered, there is a ban on the import, export, and sale of that species. These are huge protections, right? This is how we can make sure that we are, are cabining our influence on the international wildlife trade. Um, the other thing that we can do is work at CITES, and that's something that, that our organization has been doing a lot of in the past seven or eight years. Um, so CITES, again, is the treaty, the treaty that regulates trade and imperiled species. Um, we work to press to make sure the U.S. government is taking the right positions. We lobby on various species. We try to um, introduce countries to species that they may not have been thinking um, are either in trade or might be imperiled. Um, and one of the really cool things about CITES is that unlike many treaties, it actually has some teeth. Um, there are some sanctions. If you don't comply, there's actually a process that CITES allows to have some economic sanctions for countries that, that, that are violating it. And um, so we are pressing uh, in a number of cases to try to get sanctions on countries for their continued trade in uh, wildlife despite CITES bans. There you go. Thanks, yeah. Um, a question here is, um, there have been just like a handful of kind of dovetailing off that. 
um, there are probably a lot of players um, in this US, certainly one of them. Um, can one of you uh, maybe touch on who are the players that make up this web of the wildlife trade um, and um, how can we stop it perhaps internationally? I'll take that one too. <laughs> um, so who are the players? Man, they're varied. It's, it's wild. Um, certainly there's a medicinal trade that we talked about with pangolins. Um, there's a massive trophy hunting trade. Uh, Americans particularly are going around the world and killing, you know, often very cool animals in Africa to bring them home to, to put them on their walls. The pet trade, people don't even realize necessarily where the pets they're buying are coming from. And a lot of them are plucked right out of the wild. So chameleons and these gorgeous tortoises. Um, Tanya's talking about these crazy blue tarantulas. These are all part of a multi, multi, multi-million dollar pet trade. Um, the aquarium trade, U.S. is 80% of that trade. Um, you know, fit these beautiful coral reef fish being, being robbed out of their homes to be put in, in aquariums. Um, the fur trade for fur trim on coats, um, you know, snakeskin boots, uh, decor, shells for decor. It's, it's really crazy all the different ways that, that wildlife is used as a commodity. Um, you know, so who are the players? Well, we have all of those varied industries. Um, but the reality is that there's a lot of connection between and other crimes, including drug crimes. And um, wildlife trafficking is sometimes um, connected to drug crimes. That, that there's a really good example of that going on in Mexico right now um, with this gorgeous porpoise called the, the, the uh, vaquita. Um, a lot of players, there's a lot of work to do. Um, we have to start in our own backyard, right? Yep. Absolutely. Um, there's a several people asking around um, clarification about what extent climate change has exacerbated uh, the wildlife trade um, and the spread of the virus. And I'm wondering if one of you would be willing to make the connection between climate crisis and the extinction crisis and what we're talking about here tonight. Yeah. I'm, I'm right, thanks, Tanya. Take a first stab at that one, definitely. You know, it's as I was talking about sort of these zoonotic diseases and how they come to, you know, jump to humans, it really is how much humans are increasing contact with wildlife and in particular wildlife that we haven't had contact with previously. And so when you think about climate change, what it's doing is altering places where wildlife can exist. Um, it's altering resources that are available. And so in some ways it's creating movement of wildlife and changes to migration patterns and things that put people in contact with wildlife that they haven't perhaps come in contact with before. It also alters the, how wildlife are connecting to each other as well. And as, as we sort of heard about with COVID-19 potentially, you have these viruses that can jump from one species to another species. They may not make the animals sick, but it could be that those changes as they pick up that genetic material from one, one host to the next is what then enables that virus to actually affect people. So everything we're doing that's changing, um, whether we're destroying habitat, whether we're collecting new and different species for the pet trade or for other purposes, for medicinal purposes, um, and everything we're doing to affect our climate, it all comes together and it increases this possibility that we're gonna encounter more and more of these types of diseases. You know, one thing I think that was really shocking um, to me and as I started looking at all of this is you know, this, this current outbreak is a coronavirus. It's not the first one that's affected people. In fact, it's the seventh coronavirus that has made a jump from wildlife to humans. So the ones that we know about, the more recent ones are SARS and MERS. But I just think it's important that we recognize that everything we're doing to the planet comes back to us and we're connected to it all. Thanks, Tanya. Um, I have a couple questions here about 1% for the planet. Tiara, I'm wondering if you can um, perhaps field a question, a couple questions about um, where one percent, where the, or where the center would like one percent of the stimulus funds to go. Um, and then I have kind of a follow-up question on that for you. After you're done. I'm actually going to kick that over to Brett, who is our governor, government affairs expert. He's smiling at me right now. Sure. I mean, so we, you know, obviously, the government is surely going to vote and pass to spend trillions on um, rescuing the economy and dealing with this crisis. And, you know, we think it's really important to recognize the root cause 
and, and addressing and making these things less likely in the future. So some of the places it could go, um, obviously we will be happy with any money going to actually dealing with the wildlife trade. Um, one probably really important is building capacity around the world to deal with this. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service, just as an example, has attaches in a few countries um, trying to deal with elephant poaching, which is great, but it's usually one person per country um, and it's not every country. So if you think about pangolins, we have no one trying to help curb the trade of pangolins. Very few people trying to help curb the trade of rhinos. Um, we have you know, tremendous capacity and what we need to do is really show that global leadership again, which we kind of used to do and, and maybe not so much anymore on environmental issues um, to help other countries get a handle on their trade, uh, to help find them find uh, sustainable solutions. Back at home, uh, Sarah and Tanya are totally right, we still contribute to the trade. We inspect almost nothing that comes into this country. You know, we don't expect most of the goods. A lot of it's mismarked or deliberately concealed. We need so many more law enforcement officers working for the Fish and Wildlife Service at our ports of entry. Um, I mean, first of all, it's just totally inhumane the way we treat animals and we bring them into this country that we really do need to kind of change how we approach, I think, the complacency when it comes to the wildlife trade. And that's why we're trying to get uh, more money and, uh, and part of the discussion about how we spend money um, so that we don't uh, just, you know, throw, you know, breadcrumbs at this really important problem anymore. So, you know, we'll see. Um, obviously, there's going to be future bills that are going to deal with this. And we're hopeful that we can really change the conversation to address not only the, you know, the consequences of these pandemics, but the causes. Thanks. And, and Brett, there's actually a follow-up question about that, um, <clears throat> or a handful of questions about um, how are, are, are we partnering with other groups on 1% for the wildlife? And if so, um, how can other groups join? Yeah, so we had um, over 100 groups join us in our call for getting 1% um, of the, the money for wildlife. Um, you know, obviously just reach out to us. Our emails are on our website. Um, Ash can put you in contact with me and others. Uh, we definitely want it to be, you know, every environmental group saying this or something similar because we really have an important contribution to, to add to this larger conversation. This, this crisis stems from wildlife and, and habitat loss and we need everybody talking about that so that it actually becomes normal. We need to see Donald Trump getting a question asked about that every day in his press conference. So we need to change that mindset about how we treat the environment and that's part of it. Thanks so much. Okay, um, there are a couple questions about there, uh, out there. We have so many of them, so many great ones. Um, what can I do locally uh, to engage my elected officials and how, how can I participate in that way? Um, I'll just take that and then uh, hand it off to any others who may want to, uh, to answer. Um, so one great part of the work that the center does, and we work in the scientific realm, we litigate, we do a lot of really awesome media work. We also organize. And remember that your legislators, your elected officials, um, the answer to you ultimately, you, the voters, the constituents, you still have actually a lot of power in this way. Um, and even in the time of COVID, um, there are still many, many ways that you can still make your voice heard and exert people power or pressure on your elected official um, through really basic stuff, um, maybe stuff we've, we've forgotten, like writing to your elected official or calling them on the phone. Um, I've even been working with a few other groups um, that are doing virtual lobby meetings over Zoom with their legislator's office. These are all really great options and we know that the more people that we have on board, the better the pressure becomes. Um, and these are just few, few examples of starting points. Um, the whole world opens up when we talk about social media pressure as well. Um, my pitch to you is that um, start taking action through the center's website right now by signing some of these petitions um, and get more involved um, with the organizing work that the center does. If you've never been involved with center organizing work before, the call on April 7th is a great way to start. Or if you're already involved and you participate in some of our online platforms like Slack, 
Um, we're going to have a lot of digital tools at your fingertips, digital tools that we're already using and sending out um, through our communications um, already. So um, I am going to uh, pass it over. Do, would anyone else uh, like to add anything to that question? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, actually. Uh, oh, you go for it. <laughs> um, you know, I would say my other, yeah, and a great answer, Ash. Um, you know, my other suggestion for how to make an impact locally, right? is ask if you are buying a pet, if you're buying decor that has a, you know, some animal part in it, if you're buying seafood, ask where it comes from. Ask, was, is it from the wild? Ask, was it sustainably sourced? You may not get a, an honest answer, I don't know, but the more, um, the more sellers are hearing that people care about this, it's the more, the more they're gonna factor it into their own purchasing decisions. So ask, make people aware that, that you care about it and it really can make a difference. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'll also uh, just mention here before we get to the next question, one piece of federal legislation that we've worked really hard on, Brett has worked very hard on, is um, a bill called the Paw and Fin Conservation Act. And like so many bills in Congress right now, it's um, kind of a nice, but um, we know that our opponents aren't resting right now, and so neither should we. Paw and Fin Act, uh, is a piece of legislation that would uh, address uh, Trump's rollbacks to the Endangered Species Act. And as we mentioned earlier, the Endangered Species Act is one of our bedrock laws that we use to actually um, protect species, endangered species and wildlife. And we can't have Trump's cuts go through um, and using the Pond Fin Act, asking your uh, congressional member, your representative to not only support and co-sponsor this bill, but to become an outspoken champion, ensuring that they get out of the media about it and help ensure its passage uh, um, in the House first and hopefully in the Senate um, is a really great place to start. Um, and if you'd like more information about that, you can um, look on our website, savelifeonearth.org. Uh, and um, or you can email us at mobilize at biologicaldiversity.org. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, get to a next one of our questions. Um, all right. Just looking through here. Um, there are a lot of questions about pangolins. <laughs> Probably because they're so amazingly adorable. Um, like questions all over the board about um, how do we make sure penguins are protected? Are we really sure that penguins are involved in this chain? Um, anything? So I'm wondering if um, Tanya or Sarah want to say any um, additional words about pangolins in particular that you didn't already cover um, maybe cute factoids. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I think it's fairly obvious from my presentation, right? I think that these animals are totally awesome. Um, so there are, we're gonna get a little geeky. There are four species in Asia, four species in Africa. Um, there's been a fairly historic demand for pangolin scales in China. Um, so the Chinese pangolin uh, has is, is almost extinct. Um, I, am, I fear that it, it really is, you know, on the verge of extinction. Um, became almost impossible to find. Um, so demand sort of started to spread out through all over Asia. Um, at this point, all of the Asian pangolins are, are really, really in bad situation. Um, became so hard to find that demand turned its eyes to the African pangolins. And so now those pangolins are really in severe trouble too. Um, you know, they're just so stinking weird and cute, right? Save the weirdos. Um, you know, an important part of the ecosystem too. Um, you know, they, they keep termite and ant populations under control. Um, we, should, uh, we should ask Brett what he thinks of them. He's one of the only people I know personally who's, uh, who's seen them in the wild. Um, they're, they're just really awesome. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I, I, I was really lucky enough to see one in the Central African Republic uh, last year, um, the black-bellied pangolin, also called the tree pangolin, which is the only uh, species that's actually uh, diurnal. Most penguins are nocturnal. Um, and uh, just the way they move through the, the forest is just incredible. 
they had like these ridiculously long tongues um, and they're just, they're really actually cute when you see them, you can see the fur underneath and the scales on top. And yeah, like Sarah said, I mean, it's really sad because what we're seeing is this just massive wave of poaching happening all over Africa. And they're such unique animals. I think the other tragedy is that, you know, obviously every extinction is bad, but we're looking at an entire evolutionary order of life um, on the tree of life that's being wiped out. Uh, so it, it really is a, a group of species that everyone should be champions of because they're just, yeah, they're just amazing to see in person. Thanks both of you. Um, another question that um, has popped up here and there um, is questions around uh, different mechanisms or facets of life that aren't necessarily the illegal wildlife trade. So there have been a, a bunch of questions about addressing um, the pet trade, but also industrial agriculture um, and um, moving folks to plant-based diets. And so I'm wondering if one of you would be willing to talk about how um, other factors other than the elite, specifically the illegal wildlife trade, um, play into our ability to protect species and save life on Earth. Um, I saw Tanya's head shaking. Do you want to kick us off or? Yeah, why don't I get us started on that one and other folks can jump in there for sure. Um, you know, I think in this, in some ways, I think this is part of why the questions of the origins of, of COVID-19 um, are so fascinating, right? Because we don't know if this is a question of, was it an illegally trafficked pangolin that was being sold live at this market? And, and that's how this you know, virus evolved to jump to humans? Or was it just regular old wildlife trade that's totally legal within China and it just happened to read the conditions again for this virus to have jumped from a bat to another species to a person? And, you know, like you said, Ashley, like, I don't think we're ever going to know the answer to that question, but it certainly raises this issue of people coming into contact with wildlife totally legally through wild, legal wildlife trade and the risks that that poses. And I don't think that... Um, I don't think people realize that this isn't just a problem in other countries. This is something that happens in the US as well. So for example, one of the things that the center works on is rattlesnake roundups in Texas. People go out and capture live snakes. They skin them, they cook up their meat and eat it on the spot. They milk those snakes for venom. So it, this isn't a, an issue that is just happening in other countries. It's something we do in our own backyard as well. And that's why it's so critically important right now, as Brett was saying, that we seize this moment, not just internationally to make sure that we have funding, that we're working with other countries to address wildlife trade, but that we're also doing it within our own borders and our own walls. So I don't know if anyone else has anything they wanna hop in on that. Yeah, I wanna address the aspect of that question uh, relating generally to meat eating and industrial agriculture, uh, because certainly there wouldn't be this uh, trade in, in edible wildlife if we didn't eat meat. Um, and the production of meat, and that's mostly uh, industrial agriculture, not, not wildlife trade, it's the single biggest human impact on the planet. You know, 40% of all land on the planet is devoted to either directly raising cows and other, other cattle or raising food for them to eat. And so it's, it's just a massive human impact. And so if we can all, at a minimum, reduce our meat eating, which is not very difficult to do, or completely eliminate it, uh, we'll have a tremendous, tremendously um, positive impact on the planet. And, and we should also remember, a lot of times we talk about the diseases, we're talking about these exotic animals and, uh, and so forth. But a lot of diseases come from our industrial ag livestock, from our chickens, from our cattle, from our pigs. It's not just uh, exotic species. It's, it's very domesticated, common species in our lives. Um, and so even there, you know, reducing our meat intake um, would be something you can do for your health and for the planet. And uh, to find out more about that, check out the center's website. We've got a whole campaign devoted to this. Um, uh, we use it around the concept of uh, take extinction off your plate, because that's what's on your plate if you're eating meat. Yeah, 
Anyone else want to uh, dive in? Okay. We're getting close to time here, so I may uh, scroll through and ask maybe just one more question here. Um, a lot of other animals have been mentioned in the chat box. Clearly, there are a lot of animal lovers on here. You're in great company. Um, what other animals are at risk um, in the wildlife trade and, uh, and for extinction here? All right, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, lots, unfortunately. Um, you know, CITES, uh, is, it's a great treaty. Um, it covers thousands of animals, but um, we're still seeing a lot of animals that are, are on the verge of extinction. Um, you know, I, I will give you one that I work on all the time, um, which does have a link to trade, which is the vaquita, this gorgeous little porpoise in Mexico. Unfortunately, there are only 10 vaquita remaining on Earth. And it's not the vaquita that are in trade. It's um, a fish called tatuaba. And fishermen go out and they set uh, nets to catch tatuaba and it catches vaquita instead. Um, and the vaquita has declined and declined and declined to the point that, that um, it is truly on the verge of extinction. And one of the species that not many people hear about or know about, um, but still one we need to be, to be talking about and keeping informed on. I can ask everyone to, to do a Google search and check it out. Um, one of the issues that we're turning our focus on uh, here at the center in our national program is the pet trade, uh, particularly the aquarium trade. It's 8 million individual fish every single year pulled out of coral reefs um, using pretty terrible removal methods like cyanide. Um, it also uh, harms the, the reef ecosystem. Um, lots of the animals die in, tra in the, the actual transport. Um, and the, the U.S. is 80% of that market. Um, this is something that we can handle, and yet there are no protections for any of these fish, well, except for one, I guess, on uh, the Endangered Species Act. Um, sea cucumbers, another, you know, save the weirdos, right? These species that um, you know, are, are super cool looking and live on the bottom of the ocean and are important for nutrient recycling, those are disappearing. Uh, so many species, like really, it could go on and on. Um, you know, we, we need to be aware of, of what our demand is um, and, and keeping an eye on it and making sure that we're doing everything can, we can in our country. I know I sound like a broken record, but you know, we, got, we got to start here. Thanks so much. Um, and that brings us to our uh, time today. Um, thanks so much for everyone for joining. And with that, I'm going to... Um, just remind folks that you will be sent a recording of this call in email tomorrow, also um, with a few links to what we mentioned, including uh, our next call in two weeks. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Kiran to wrap us up for the evening. Kiran? Well, thanks. Hey, it was really exciting to see so many people get on this call, uh, ask such great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Um, but, you know, in addition to folks signing up here uh, uh, to join and help out on these issues, we're going to be doing uh, additional calls like this uh, throughout the period of this corona crisis while people are home um, to sort of just keep everyone connected and use this, this time of, of slowdown to reach out digitally. Uh, to our supporters um, and have a little more time for in-depth discussion. So look to uh, see more email invites uh, from us and certainly pass them on to your friends as well. And look forward to talking to you again before this is all over and hopefully it will be over sooner than later. Bye-bye.